The introduction of Ethernet APL technology earlier this year is an important technology milestone, enabling a new high-performance paradigm of digital field communications for the process industries. Its dramatically higher bandwidth and delivered power promise to enable a new generation of far more capable field devices in hazardous and highly distributed locations. And because it's based on Ethernet, it really ultimately promises to unify and dramatically simplify the control and information architecture of tomorrow. But from a practical perspective, there are tens of millions of analog 4 to 20 milliamp instruments installed around the world, and their numbers continue to grow daily. No one will be tearing them out anytime soon. Further, these analog devices are joined by a growing number of wireless monitoring instruments that are helping to realize the industrial IoT ambitions of process manufacturers around the world. So how, you may be wondering, can all these devices coexist and work together tomorrow and for decades to come? Well, my name is Keith Larson, editor of Control Magazine and ControlGlobal.com, and you're listening to a Solution Spotlight edition of our Control Amplified podcast, sponsored this week by Emerson. To help answer this very important question, I'm happy to be joined by Peter Zornio, Chief Technology Officer for Emerson's Automation Solutions Business. Welcome, Peter. A real pleasure to chat with you today. Hi, Keith. It's always great to talk with you. For those of our listeners waiting with bated breath, I'll spill the beans. What 4 to 20 milliamp analog, wireless, and Ethernet APL devices have in common is, of course, the HART protocol. Peter, to start things out, can you maybe recap for our listeners a little bit about the original 4 to 20 milliamp HART protocol and how it came to be, and how it's really continued to stay relevant now for what, more than three decades now? Sure, Keith. I'm happy to do so, and uh, I have to admit I, I was there, so I've, <laughs> I've been in the industry for a long time, and... Yeah. Kind of make a question that sort of makes me feel a little old, but what <laughs> happened was uh, in the in the late 80s, uh, mid to late 80s, as intelligent field devices with microprocessors were first coming out in the industry, every vendor was also coming out with their own digital protocol to communicate with those intelligent devices. And most of the time, the vendors that were doing so were doing it in a relatively closed manner where they were licensing that protocol as a communications between their own systems and their field devices, or maybe their own partners in the field device areas. Whereas the, the industry and the customer base was looking for something that could be used interchangeably across multiple vendors. So Rosemont, which is now of course part of Emerson and has been for a long time, actually pioneered the Heart Protocol at that time as their open digital protocol because Rosemont was a big instrument vendor, but really did not have a large presence in the system side. So they were really looking to promote something that the instrument community would see as an open protocol for communication with control systems. And one of the things that I think they did from a technical point of view that was very smart was they added the HARP protocol as a digital signal that was superimposed over the existing very ubiquitous 4 to 20 milliamp a communication signal for for the measurement signal and for the control signal. So basically you got digital information in addition to the 4 to 20 control signal, which made it so that all the systems that were in place, all the you know local displays that were in place, you know, an instrument text current meter, all those things still worked. You just had the opportunity to take advantage of this this extra digital information. Mm -hmm. And that got picked up pretty rapidly by a, a number of other instrument vendors who were looking for anything that was, you know, open and ubiquitous to use, not tied to one particular system vendor. Mm -hmm. And then we also started a very specific effort to develop an official standard for a protocol. Well, we might mention that again, you know, as in the future, which is the Foundation Field Bus Protocol Standard. But by then, the HARP protocol was kind of up and running and its ability to operate in any installed based control system and, and the ease that it brought in terms of not disturbing existing work processes had kind of let it building up a, a big head of steam. Yeah. And then in the last 20 years or so, all the system vendors have come out with much more flexible uh, IO solutions that allow HARP devices to get some of the same benefits of the reduced wiring and the installation characteristics that Foundation Field Bus would be. So that's also increased the level of hard adoption that we've seen and kind of cemented hard as the de facto standard for field devices. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then last but not least, uh, you know, about uh, 2006 or so, 2007, the digital wireless version of Heart became a standard mm-hmm. and it's achieved some good usage as a wireless standard. And that's considerably different than the 4 to 20 standard because that one's actually all digital. Obviously, there's no 4 to 20 signal over the airways. Right. Yeah, so um, do you think that that kind of continuity of work processes is is partly what what uh, caused maybe Foundation Field Bus and other field bus alternatives to underachieve back around the turn of the century? Yeah, I think if we look back, if, as I talk to customers, certainly everyone liked the idea of an all digital field communication protocol. They like the idea of the multi-drop and the potential wiring savings that Foundation Field Bus came to bring. But what they found when they actually went into doing installation was that it required significant retraining of their workforce. It required additional engineering hours at the upfront design part and that they needed you know, smarter technicians to come and troubleshoot when something went wrong with the field best technology, or maybe not smarter, maybe I should use more well-trained. Mm-hmm. Actually, the term that I hear from customers a lot is, you know, an instrument technician can work on a heart device. It takes a control system technician to work on foundation field bus. So foundation field bus technology works, works very well. Emerson was certainly one of the big supporters of it when it was first coming out. We're still very proud of our state-of-the-art, we think best-in-class, solution we have for foundation field bus but the customers that have not adopted foundation field bus typically tell me they are not adopting it because of the changes in work practices and the increased training and complexity that it brings that they're not sure their workforce is going to be willing to handle Mm -hmm. are there some lessons to be learned in that as we look at the next journey of all digital with ethernet apl adoption or some lessons to be learned from from uh, that situation absolutely in fact it's the number one thing having you know lived through the early versions of the digital protocols having been engaged in the development of the foundation field bus standard having been there promoting it watching its successes and maybe not so big success that we'd hope for in the industries. I'm a firm believer that we need to look at that and make sure we don't repeat some of the errors that, you know, if you want to call them that, that we did with Foundation Field Bus. And it really does come down to what I've already talked about, and that is making sure that the introduction of the APL technology does not bring the same sort of dramatic step change in training, work process, work practices, and skill sets that customers will need. If it does, it's going to suffer the exact same hurdle that Foundation Field Bus did, and that is getting customers to adopt it because of complexity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one of my first uh, conversations or introductions to user-centered design was 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 chatting with you probably 10 15 years ago and and, and some of the initiatives you, you had going on there at emerson and around that initiative are there some user experience principles that apply to to this sort of a proposed migration to a new technology yeah absolutely and what it is you know we talk a lot internally and and it's kind of an hdd principle about the relative amount of gain for the relative amount of pain. And of course, that's a principle that can apply anywhere. But I think you can see it very clearly here, whereas the heart technology, when it was introduced, added digital technology on top of an existing analog ecosystem. And you could do everything you did before. It was just more. It was just if you wanted to take advantage of the digital technology, you could and it was retrofittable. Mm-hmm. Here, you know, the HCD principle would say, well, if we introduce a lot of new pain again for getting the all digital gain and the other benefits that APL will bring, such as the increased power to the device and hopefully some, some easier uh, communication interoperability with other ethernet-based devices, that's gonna slow the adoption. 
So it, it really does come down to making it so that the, you know, the, the work of a customer to get the, the benefits in return is a good equation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when, when Wireless Heart was, you mentioned Wireless Heart earlier, um, was first introduced, obviously it was, you needed a way to backhaul that data over, over an ethernet uh, network once, once it was in a wired back to an access point. In a way that seems to have kind of anticipated the development of ethernet APL because you had Heart IP now running, running over ethernet. Can you describe some of the, the latest features of Heart IP now that make it suitable to go all the way down to the field devices? Sure. That was actually, uh, you're correct. That was sort of the first application, at least at Emerson. We're not sure if somebody else uh, might have used Hard IP in, in another product somewhere where we, you know, we realized, hey, we have all this heart, we have these digital heart messages, whether they're coming superimposed on a 4 to 20 wire or whether they're coming, let's call it natively digital over the airways with wireless heart we need to aggregate them and send them at a more higher bandwidth way. And in 2012 is when we first standardized Heart IP. And in the field, I think at that time, it might've been the Heart Foundation, not the Fieldcom group still in 2000. As we've gone forward and we look at Heart IP being used more broadly, probably the single biggest thing we've added is cybersecurity. So mm -hmm. there's a number of cybersecurity features that we've added that we've made mandatory in hard IP, mm -hmm. which we think is a big deal. Wireless hard also has mandatory cybersecurity in order to make it so that people can be very secure right. about using the heart protocol for control functions. Because when you say heart, you know, most, I'm going to guess 90% of the customer base knows heart, you know, from the four to 20 heart where you know, it's superimposed over an analog signal still, and they're using the analog signal as the core control signal. When you tell them heart's going to be the all digital signal for their core control, well, then obviously they're going to have a lot of questions on cybersecurity. Right. When you tell them it's going to be running on an IP network like APL, well, then those questions go up even more, and they should. Yeah. So we've put a lot of work, we in the committees have put a lot of work into making sure that hard IP is very cyber secure as we look at using it uh, directly for control. Mm -hmm. So that's another enhancement, I guess, in the in the latest version is is replacing the the four to twenty milliamp as well, so that you can do control actions and uh, process measurements or control variables on on the heart network as well. Yeah, that's a good point. There was some of that that was also done on wireless heart mm -hmm. uh, because we had devices on wireless heart that were output type devices, um, but that's also been carried over and standardized in uh, hard IP to make sure that it can do that control mission in every way. Makes a lot of sense. Interoperability is another key attribute, I think, of the overall heart ecosystem that's really been hard won over the years. Will that in same interoperability goodness carry over into the the next generation of hard IP over Ethernet APL devices that we'll soon be seeing on the market? Yes. And frankly, that is probably, from, from my perspective, when you talk about not changing work practices, easing the technology into a customer site or a new customer site and making it easy to learn, that very capable and rich interoperability ecosystem that we've developed around heart which by the way is shared with with foundation field bus mm -hmm. is probably the biggest thing that wireless heart is bringing to the party that's going to make it easy to use right i would say that you will not find a better more mature more interoperable protocol ecosystem than heart across all of the different protocols that are out there today whether they're mm -hmm. on uh, Ethernet or, you know, proprietary networking even still. I mean, we have a very mature situation where vendors' devices, no matter what vendor they're from, run through the Heart Foundation, get certified, and they work on another vendor's host system, and they can be configured on that other vendor's host sy system simply by providing a file. Uh, in the beginning, a DD file, then an EDDL file, and now what we call an FDI package, which is a very rich 
configuration environment that combines the best benefits of, of EDDL, which we've used for many years, mm -hmm. and also many of the features that were in FDT DTM to provide an integration and configuration environment that has the best of both those worlds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you just, end users have come to just expect that a heart device will work on their control system and that they're not forced to use also specific configuration tools from specific vendors to make those devices work. Right. So they can right. pick a configuration package that is their favorite configuration package, whether it's ours or someone else's, and expect and witness that a heart device will be configurable and integrated into the control environment. And all the major control systems provide a very rich integration to that heart data right off the back of that automatic configuration that you get from the tool. So the, the ease of configuration of any third-party device, the ease of integrating that data into the control environment, those are all things that now have been done, you know, probably for at least 10 years that users know work well and they've come to expect and to have just work. And with heart over APL, with heart IP, mm -hmm they can expect the same thing. Yeah, so you really think about it, since nobody's gonna be ripping out these uh, analog instruments anytime soon, especially in a, in a brownfield environment, you have a continuity of experience, I guess, if you have a mixed environment uh, on these different platforms, it's, it's likely to be around for quite some time. Yes, exactly. And, you know, I actually, I believe, you know, Ethernet APL is, is largely going to be a greenfield technology. Uh, I don't think we're going to see customers going in and, you know, and, and upgrading existing foundation field bus or 4 to 20 or, or any other protocol devices unless they, they really have a specific application that's driving the need for the increased data that they'll be able to get with, with APL. And the experience they should be able to get will be, you know, a 4 to 20 device, a wireless heart device and a hard IP device over APL, configure it from the same tool, same look and feel, mm -hmm. they won't know that it's any different. It should look you know, no different than when your laptop is, you're looking at your email over a wireless network versus a, a wired line. If, if any of us do that anymore, it seems like <laughs> typically we're all using wireless, yeah. but it will be that same sort of experience. Well, that makes sense. That certainly seems a more straightforward path than, than trying to introduce a, another uh, new protocol. I think we've had enough new protocols over the years. But uh, Hart's been with us for a long time, but is it reasonable to expect that it'll serve all the communication needs of all types of devices going into the future? So we've done some very complex devices with uh, wireless Hart. Mm -hmm. With Hart over four to 20, we typically find that it's simpler devices such as, you know, temperature transmitters, pressure transmitters, level transmitters, simple devices with, with maybe, let's say, you know, 50 or 100 pieces of data to communicate that we use with 4 to 20 heart because the speed of 4 to 20 heart is very slow. Right. Okay, that, you know, it, it does go back a long way. It is a signal superimposed over an analog signal. And it's a very low bandwidth to make sure that, that it will work and it will work over all kinds of different wire. But that means the data doesn't come up very fast. And that's the biggest negative experience I would say people have had with 4 to 20 heart. Mm -hmm. With wireless heart, we have a much faster band rate. And we've been able to do much more complex devices, such as, for instance, a vibration transmitter, mm -hmm. where we've been actually able to communicate an entire wireless spectrum over the digital signal. So we think with hard IP, there really isn't a device that, you know, is out there that we expect that the heart protocol itself, you know, the fundamental commands and the structure of the way the data moves won't be able to handle. And of course, you're going to have much greater bandwidth. You're going to have 10 megabits with, with APL. Mm -hmm. So you think in terms of instrumentation types, there aren't any that we can foresee heart, you know, won't be able to handle. Right. Now, when you go into the world of electrical equipment, there are other protocols that have been used over Ethernet for a long time, such as Ethernet IP 
or Profinet that you know already have you know a pretty good presence in the market as protocols in the electrical world. I would propose that we probably could use hard IP there, but again, I think because customers that are already using those protocols already have workforces that are trained in those protocols are going to want to continue with them, we're probably going to see those protocols as the ones that we still see being used in the electrical world. Mm -hmm. APL might have all kinds of other new devices on there. There might be cameras or other more complex mm -hmm. sound sensors or, or things that we don't even think of now because it is Ethernet. So right. it would be able to support pretty much any Ethernet compatible protocol and some of those devices might bring their own protocols. And, and there's nothing stopping you from having a shared infrastructure with multiple protocols on it, which is kind of a, a mindset uh, switch <laughs> when, you, when you're moving to more of an Ethernet type of infrastructure, isn't it? Yeah, that, that is correct. But I think in reality what we're going to see is there will still be some segmentation because people will want to have you know, a, a segment of the network that they know is dedicated for control purposes and has the bandwidth reservation reliability being used for control, but then they'll probably bring it together possibly at the trunk level at the higher speed 100 megabits for when they're bringing in other devices, potentially like cameras. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, Peter, you mentioned FDI is, is really a key component in this interoperability equation for, for hard. How, do, how does that play as we move, move into um, this Ethernet APL world? How does, does FDI continue to play the same sort of role that it has in the past, or how does that work? Yes, FDI is a key component of making sure that as device manufacturers build devices with lots of new features and capability and parameters, that the host systems that connect to those devices are able to auto discover those features and technology. And FDI also provides the ability for the device vendor to provide even user interfaces mm -hmm. in the form of, for instance, web pages that allow the end user to see the device in the way the device manufacturer intended it to be seen and to be configured. So it allows device manufacturers a freedom to add capabilities and features that are then auto-discovered by the systems on which they're hosted and become integrated into those host systems. Okay, yeah, so so will that allow, I guess, some of these tasks and configuration tasks and those sort of things to be more automated in general in the, in the future than, than, than in the past? Yes, we see that, especially as you get into thousands of devices yeah. uh, in our particular tool for configuring devices, we actually have templates and scripts and we actually have a whole auto configuration. You know, and I think that's another difference that we're going to see is uh, as we look at process devices, you know, you're going to see those in the thousands in a big facility. And some of the other protocols that are used to dealing with maybe, let's say, electrical devices, you're dealing with a much smaller number of devices. And I think you'll find that that configuration process uh, is more manual, takes longer, and the tools are not nearly as automated. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, thanks so much, Peter, for sharing your perspective with us today. It's a, as always been very thought-provoking and, and a real pleasure. For those of you listening, thanks for tuning in, and thanks also to Emerson for sponsoring this episode. My name, again, is Keith Larson, and, and I've been talking with uh, Peter Zornio, Chief Technology Officer for the Automation Solutions Business at Emerson. And this has been a Control Amplified podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe at the iTunes Store and at Google Podcasts. Plus, you can find the full archive of past episodes at controlglobal.com. Thanks again, Peter. Really appreciate you joining us. Keith, always a pleasure talking to you and your listeners. Okay, great. Signing off. Until next time. Take care.